Uh, good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present the Air Force's experience with uh, prolonged field care in the pararescue capacity. Um, I have no disclosures. So the NATO definition of prolonged field care is field medical care that is applied beyond doctrinal timing timelines. So in other words, you've already completed the TCCC um, machinations of uh, care under fire and tactical field care, and you are trying to evacuate your patient, and lo and behold, there's, you can't do that immediately for whatever reason. Unfortunately, a lot of the medical intel from these sorts of missions remains at the unit level, um, oftentimes in after action reports or even just in the memories of the uh, providers who took care of those patients. Mm -hmm. Um, so we really need to kind of drill down and try and identify the epidemiology and what are the factors that affect prolonged field care. Um, of personal interest to myself, uh, given that I was a PJ flight doc for a number of years, um, the, uh, I wanted to look at pararescue and what their experience was uh, with prolonged field care. PJs and just in general, they are an elite uh, force that's really, their primary role is to be postured for personnel recovery. Um, that includes a, a large amount of medical training to ensure that they are able to take care of the personnel that they recover. Um, and so we wanted to basically do a subset analysis of some work that we had done last spring um, where we did a retrospective review of prolonged field care encounters. This, was, this data was obtained via surveys that were solicited not only on the prolonged field care um, website, but also from military units that would be um, uh, performing this kind of work. Uh, it involved both structured and unstructured questions, so open-ended questions. And then uh, we basically wanted to set a cutoff of basically any, any person that was taken care of in the field that we had information on for more than four hours. And then we performed a subset analysis uh, where a PJ was the actual care provider. And so that's the results that we'll show you. Uh, we received a total of 59 surveys over the course of about a year, and uh, we had to exclude a few of those surveys, either because of lack of detail or just because there was too much detail about too many things uh, we really couldn't drill down on. Uh, we ended up with 40, uh, 54 patients on 41 medevac emissions over the course of about 15 years, and uh, 20, so about a third of those, uh, were taken care of by a pararescue man. As far as combatant command for pararescue missions, uh, the majority of the pro uh, prolonged field care missions took place in uh, U.S. Pacific Command. Um, there were a few in both AFRICOM and NORTHCOM. Uh, for contributing factors, the primary contributing factor, not only in the PJ data, but in the data overall, was the remoteness of the location. And in the case of pararescue, um, it was primarily both uh, mountainous and maritime environments. Uh, the mode of infill, infill is really important um, to note for pararescue because they were, within the data set, the only ones that were actually jumping onto the X to take care of the, of the patient. Uh, but they, the majority were infilled by, uh, by aircraft. And then we look at the, where the treatment actually took place. So where was the patient taken care of? Um, what sort of modes of transport were required to get them to the next level of care? Um, you can see it, more important than just the individual numbers is the fact that in 30% of those cases, they actually had to use either one, two or more actual locations, uh, two or more aircraft, or uh, modes of transportation. So it really just kind of speaks to the need to be able to transition between modes of care. Uh, patient classifications uh, across the board, they all had either life, limb, or eye-threatening uh, conditions. Um, the majority were non-battle injury and, non and uh, medical illness that were taken care of. And in the pie chart, you can see that it's broken down. There was, uh, of the injuries, which there were 12, uh, there was a third of those were burns, and some of them quite severe, up to 70, 80 percent. Um, there was a, a small amount of penetrating trauma. There was actually three bear maulings and then uh, some blunt trauma from uh, vehicular means. As far as how long did it take to get these patients to the next level of care, um, this is really the only part where you're seeing the non-PJ data. Um, in this case, so uh, everybody else, they were going on missions that were, say, median of five hours uh, with a range of up to 60. For the pararescue, not only did they have really a longer duration in field, um, in, in some cases up to five days, uh, but they actually had twice as many encounters that were over 24 hours in length. Um, and I don't put the mortality there to say that one's better than the other. That's, we only had, uh, there was just one um, death of the 20 for the pararescue cases. So in, in a way to kind of discuss, I also wanted to bring in some of the things that were presented uh, as far as the, um, the open-ended sort of feedback. Because a lot of the meat to these missions is really in the after-action um, kind of readback. 
So things like shipboard operations, you know, how do we take care of the patient not only on the ship, but how do we transition and uh, transport a patient from the ship down to a smaller boat for evac? Uh, the use of telemedicine came up time and time again um, as a way to be a force multiplier and um, uh, really kind of give you that warm fuzzy as a PJ um, when you're trying to take care of a complicated patient. Um, being able to do long-term, uh, in this case, you know, a couple days, we're not talking long-term like years, but uh, long-term TBI management, and the use of monitors and ventilators that are offered in battery dependent, um, and how to, how to maximize the use of those in a prolonged uh, manner. Uh, patient hygiene, of course, comes up uh, often, especially in burn patients, where you're taking care of a burn patient for about five days, and, and you start to run out of things like gloves, and then they felt uh, kind of insecure about their training in pediatrics. As far as things that they can better prepare, a lot of this is you know, really Im implementable at the unit level immediately. Um, and in, in many situations it is, just having pre-planned sort of pack outs for when, uh, w you know, based on the number of patients that you're expecting. Um, something that you wouldn't necessarily expect, but seasickness, that's something that can be incapacitating for a rescuer, um, but you need to kind of think about that, especially since they had such a, uh, a large uh, proportion of maritime um, uh, events. And then the use of high visibility equipment for civil and humanitarian ops where a covert, a covert posture is really not needed. And then just purely from a performance standpoint, just improving documentation uh, through the use of things like the prolonged field care card, which kind of reads a little bit like an anesthesia uh, run chart, and then uh, utilization of uh, teleconsultation. So in conclusion, prolonged field care really is a, a vital subset of military medicine. Um, you know, what is old is becoming new again, especially as we shift to, to different uh, areas of responsibility. Uh, pararescue missions compose a large portion of what we know about prolonged field care, um, and they have some unique features, such as the maritime aspect, the parachute insertion, and really some of the duration uh, that they were dealing with. And lessons learned from this uh, should help inform not only uh, the training and equipping of, of PJs, but also medics uh, within the DOD as a whole. I would like to acknowledge our prolonged field care working group and all the providers that actually um, provided cases. And just given recent events, I'd also like to just acknowledge those that we lost um, about a month ago um, that gave their lives doing uh, these things that we do that others may live. Thank you.